see. Uh, I see. Yeah. The, okay. Uh, I did one of your brothers that said they signed on with the wrong link. Should my brother Tim Mendelson? Maybe a gen circulate. Tell him to try again. The link. But if he's if he's chatting, right. Exactly. <laughs> I'll tell me. He's on the... Okay, good. Thank you very much. Are we ready? Excited. All right, if you, you guys are ready. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. You Go ahead. Uh, oh, okay. Good morning. I wanted to welcome uh, for the Diversity School of Medicine and one of the two resident morning. Fraser Costco, sir. Am I you join us? us for honoring Dr. Robert. As always, questions via the Q&A function. Go, which I will be here later in the talk. Tell us a little bit more about the, um, Dr. Department of Medicine. Well, thank you so much introduction. Uh, to have this lectureship today, which is an honor of Dr. H today. <laughs> uh, Mendelssohn would be in there. He has sat every of our staunchest uh, attenders of Grand Rounds and a really committed academician and a wonderful clinician. So uh, uh, for, uh, I'm sure you can enjoy this grand rounds this morning. So listen, um, he actually in Lee for undergrad, and he is very proud of his WNL heritage. Um, about some of the political changes, though, bridge WNL to uh, to incorporate. That said, he uh, he graduated with distinction from WNL and then came to Washington, where he was on a Jackson and Johnson scholarship, a full ride scholarship to Washington University School of Medicine, which at that time the tuition was now in those days, but but at the time it was a lot of money and it made a difference in his education. Dr. Mendelssohn was an extraordinary medical student and was inducted into AOA society. He did his internship at, at Barnes Hospital and then went to the NIH for a couple of years to do research where he was very engaged in the development of assays for B12 and became fascinated uh, by benign hematology. He then did more years of residency in Cincinnati and came back to Washington University to do a hematology fellowship with Dr. Ed Reinhardt, the head of hematology at the time. Um, and then he was a chief resident at Jewish Hospital, again, a very distinguished position for really the best clinicians and best teachers. Um, and then Dr. Mendelssohn went into private practice here on campus and, and was uh, engaged with medical student and resident education all of his career. So for almost 50 years, he has taken extraordinary care of patients. He, he's an very enthusiastic 
enthusiastic, very energetic clinician who firmly believed in um, the secret to the care of the patient was in caring for the patient. And as I said, he was always in grand rounds, always attending. And if somebody was in his seat, we had to <laughs> make sure they knew not to take that seat. And then when we switched to online, Dr. Mendelson was usually the first one to email me to tell me if the link wasn't working or if the sound was, it would always count on him to be the voice of, of the audience. Um, and we are, uh, are really privileged to, to welcome Dr. Mendelson and Dr. Mendelson's family. He has uh, four kids, two of whom ended up as academic physicians, one a pediatric geneticist, his daughter, Nancy, and his son, Mike, who uh, is a uh, cardwished investigator and an academic um, physician as an expert in clinical trials and industry and improve quality of life. And then he also has two other kids and then 11 grandkids, one uh, great-grandchild and apparently another great-grandchild COVID baby on the way. So um, I um, am very thankful that they can all be here with us. We do have Dr. Mike Mendelson. Did you want to add in a lectureship, which was was really by the Mendelssohn family. Uh, thank you very much, Vicki. I'll just make a couple quick comments on behalf of my father, who's listening to these rounds now by Zoom. And on behalf of my brother, Dr. C. Mendelssohn, as well as our entire extended family, it's a real pleasure to come to this annual lecture I'm named, which was a established into family, patients, colleagues, and friends with the strong guidance and support of Dr. Frazier. All of the lectureship is to provide resources for the Department of Medicine chair to bring a special and distinguished speaker to St. Louis each year and to support the research and education in the Department of Medicine, so important to dad. And we were just delighted to learn that uh, the distinguished chair of internal medicine from Michigan had accepted the invitation to deliver this year's lecture. So we thank you very much, Dr. Frazier, for your very kind and supportive remarks about our dad. Uh, we would also like to recognize him and honor him today. 94th birthday, and he remains very, in I'm, I, I'm just, a, a, proud to see Isaacson's book on Jennifer Dudna, The Code Breaker. As you said, he still attends these Grand Rounds weekly. And he's on Lincoln's Springfield years at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Wash U. So he's adapted well to Zoom alongside all the rest of us. And uh, you heard about dad's deep connection to Wash U. We all remember how much he loved teaching and patient care and as you alluded to, his practice of medicine in the spirit of Francis Peabody, understanding the secret of patient care by caring deeply for each of his patients. So it's my privilege to say these few words and now turn the proceedings over to Dr. introduce Dr. Carruthers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mendelssohn. So I have the wonderful honor of introducing our Grand Rounds of Mendelssohn Lecture speaker, Dr. John Carruthers, who comes to us from Michigan University, where he is a chair of internal medicine. For those of you not in the field of gastro, Carruthers is a giant and leader in our field. Prior to changing how we all think about colorectal cancer risk, um, he attended Wayne State University for undergraduate and medical school, then Mass Gen for residency before attending University of Michigan for his fellowship training in gastroenterology. He's com he completed a postdoctoral research um, in genetics and the mechanisms of cell 
and colon cancer. He has been awarded numerous grants and many awards, including the um, Robert Wood Johnson Harold Amos Research Award earlier in his career, and he's been elected to the National Academy of Medicine. His most recent national achievement is being selected as the president of um, president elect of the AGA. So it's with gratitude and excitement that we welcome Dr. Carruthers to give his talk on environmental influences on colorectal cancer. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fritz, Dr. Frazier, Dr. Mendelson, and Dr. Robert Mendelson uh, listening and the, the Mendelson family. It's certainly a, a true honor uh, to speak in the legacy of Dr. Mendelson. And uh, thank you for having me today. And I wish I was there in person. I wish you um, uh, uh, hopefully uh, um, good, good well in the hospital. And uh, I hope uh, my talk will even make you feel better, hopefully. <laughs> Let me, um, I'm gonna switch on the slides here. Can everyone see that just to make sure? Um, again, thank you for having me. Um, the disclosures are up, but uh, I'll just, uh, I had uh, NIH and University of Michigan Research Funding, and I'm an independent board director of Avantor, which is not a pharmaceutical company, it's a life sciences supply company. So I'm, uh, the talk I'm gonna provide today is uh, giving some <laughs> concepts on gene environmental interaction for the development of colorectal cancer. Um, so I'm gonna give you some general concepts and then I wanna give you examples of how the genetics can change the environment and then how the environment can change the genetics. Just close with a little bit on the microbiome. Uh, WashU is well known for their microbiome uh, research um, just to summarize things and some of the interesting findings uh, that look at this genetic environmental interaction concept. For those who uh, are not in GI, um, our general understanding of how colorectal cancer develops uh, grossly is through development of exophytic growths we call polyps or specifically adenomas that can progress and acquire genetic changes uh, simultaneously with that uh, um, gross progression uh, to uh, develop cancer. And these are just some endoscopic pictures of a variety of how adenomas might look in the colon. Some of them um, are very round and, um, uh, or oblong. Um, some of them have long stalks and others are, have this um, appearance of flatness and can be serrated uh, uh, polyps or cancers. But the general thinking is that as it uh, develops um, grossly, the genetic changes are occurring simultaneously to help it develop grossly. Now, specifically, if you look in the United States, we have about 150,000 cases of colorectal cancer each year. And if you think about it, about a third has what I call a familial component. That means either a first degree brother, father, uh, mother, brother, sister ha may have a history of cancer or even a second degree relative. So about a third have some familial component. About two thirds do not, no family history. And we call those, uh, that group sporadic. But even under the group of familial, about a third, we only understand um, a small percent of them because those we have been able to identify individual uh, single Mendelian inherited uh, uh, genes that cause some of these uh, syndromes. For instance, Lynch or familial adenomas polyposis or FAP and some other rare syndromes. Indeed, for those who are GI fellows, um, you would, it's great to take a snapshot of this uh, uh, chart because this is a nice list of some of the adenomas uh, inherited syndromes um, and their genes and their locations and the type of inheritance pattern. I won't go through these individually, but this, is, this has been evolved over the last 30 years on this understanding of the genetic cause of some of these uh, syndromes. And likewise, for those who might be GI fellows or geneticists, these are the genetics of the hamartomas polyposis syndromes um, and their mutated genes and their frequency and germline, et cetera. But I just wanted to point out that there is, that there is a clear cut of these syndromes where an individual gene can cause 
the inheritance of uh, and increase your cancer uh, risks in the colon. But is that the only driver? You know, I showed you that, that pie graph of uh, one third familial, two thirds sporadic. Um, and so is it all genetics that's driving these cancers or is it the environment? And this is a study from about two decades ago that tried to answer this, but looking at uh, 45,000 pairs of twins. Uh, so it's 90,000 people. And in these twins, this is a European study. They knew who exactly who were fraternal or dizygotic or identical or monozygotic twins. And through a mathematical model could uh, discern what was the genetic component if uh, one or both had cancer uh, compared to non-genetic or environmental component. Um, overall, a twin of a person who had cancer had increased risk for the same cancer uh, from their um, uh, other twin. Interesting with their mathematical model, and this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, three tumors showed statistical inherited genetic components. Uh, the three were prostate. They said 42% of what went into prostate cancer was genetic. Colorectal cancer, 35% went, went into colon cancer was genetic. And breast cancer, and that was 28%. Uh, uh, the rest didn't reach their statistical significance for that. But on the flip side, looking at shared and non-shared environmental factors, the non-shared environmental factors were the dominant driver of what was associated with these cancers in these twins. And they concluded that overall, the environment had the overall principal role of causing sporadic uh, cancers, even despite there were some components of genetics. If you think about this, um, we're all there's we're approaching eight billion people in the world, and yes, um, we're all a little bit different because we all have different SNPs, etc. Um, passed on, but those combination of SNPs, or if you have one of those inherited Mendelian uh, genes, you are a genetically susceptible individual, uh, and if you're exposed to the macro environment, um, that combination can increase or change your risk for certain types of cancers as shown uh, here. And the way I think of this for colon cancer is I break this down into non-modifiable risk factors and modifiable risk factors. The non-modifiable are the things that you have no control over. You know, you're, and this is in the green box is what I call the family history, which is really what you inherit in your germline, whether they're high risk alleles or low risk alleles, and your race, ethnicity, and uh, ancestry, which is really your background genetic makeup. And then on top of that, uh, unless someone can tell me that you can control time, your age is a non-modifiable risk factor. But I will argue with you on the modifiable risk factors, it's all environmental susceptibility. In fact, almost all of these things control the level of inflammation uh, in and around the colon. What's in your diet that affects your gut microbiome, the use of tobacco, insects, hormone replacement therapy, et cetera. The only thing in this modifiable risk factor category for changing your risk for colon cancer is the use of screening and its utilization. But these two things combined, particularly for the colon, give you your ultimate colorectal cancer risk. Now, on the genetic side, how does the environment uh, affect the genetics? Well, we know um, uh, from years and years of research that uh, things in the environment can alter the things in the DNA. That could be from oxidative damage, UV light. Of course, we don't have UV in the colon, of course, but the, this is an example that could affect skin, for instance. But direct carcinogens, uh, spontaneous deamination, et cetera, that can affect uh, gene transcription, gene translation, uh, or alter it to uh, either cause mutation or ultimately cell demise. In the colon specifically, um, there's been about 30 to 35 years of research that have now enlightened us onto the patterns of these genomic instability. And I'm just going to walk through this uh, briefly. This upper graph shows the mutations per uh, megabase in a logarithmic scale. Uh, and the, uh, this is the y-axis. The x-axis shows the status of the tumors and 
breakdown of the type of phen uh, genotype in the tumor. For instance, MSI stands for microcyte stability. I'll talk about that in a minute. CIMP stands for CPI, the methylator phenotype. And MLH1 is a uh, mismatch repair gene that gets silenced by methylation. The bottom line is, if you look at just characterizing the number of mutations in the tumor, about 15% are characterized by hypermutated because they contain 100 to 1,000 mutations. Remember, this is a logarithmic scale compared to 85% of all colon cancers that have maybe a handful of mutations, certainly under 10, 10 mutations. And when you look at this, the ones that are hypermutated are almost all microsatellite unstable due to MLH1 silencing. And then in particular, if you take this box and blow it up with this inset, you can see with this gray box is the methylation of this one gene MLH1, uh, and there's a few that are not, but those few that are not are really um, mutations in the polymerase epsilon gene, which does gene editing and can cause a lot of mutations. The other thing to point out, if you look at these two bar graphs below this, um, the pattern of gene mutations that drive these cancers are totally different. Those who are hypermutated essentially accumulate mutations in genes because of the structure of the gene having um, what we call coding microsatellites. And I'll touch base on that later, but remember it's the structure of the gene that drives this. And there's almost an even split of the genes when they become mutated. This is markedly different from non-hypermutated tumors, the old, what we call Vogelgram model named after Bert Vogelstein, at which only a handful of genes are consistently mutated, APC, P53, KRAS, et cetera, and a long tail of mutations that are unique to each individual's tumor um, uh, because they're individual uh, subsequent drivers besides the main mutations, um, almost like a fingerprint identification of who the tumor came from. Now, can the environment change those mutations? And now this is a wonderful, wonderful study by Steve O'Keefe from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, who uh, tried to address this by looking at dietary exchanges between African-Americans in the United States and rural Africans from Africa. And what he did is he took a pre-intervention uh, colon biopsy followed by a post-intervention colon biopsy and a fecal collection. And in between did a two week period of diet exchanges. In other words, the African-Americans who were typically on a westernized diet were fed a high fiber, low fat African style diet that contained legumes and uh, grains. The rural Africans on the flip side were given a classic heavy westernized diet for those two weeks. And then he compared the changes in the mucosal biopsies as well as in the fecal material. And this was just fascinating. So this is just a two week exchange. On this left uh, series of bar graphs, uh, KI67 is a proliferation marker. So after uh, two weeks, the African-Americans on the rural African diet had half the rate of proliferation in their colonic crypts and the Africans on the westernized diet doubled their rate in just two weeks. If you look at the intraepithelial lymphocyte uh, counts, a measure of inflammation, localized inflammation, the African-Americans who went on the uh, rural African diet cut their inflammation statistically, whereas the Africans on a new westernized diet increased the level of inflammation. And that was also followed by inflammation with a macrophage marker as well. If you look at some of the components of this dietary exchange in the uh, colon. Um, so first, butyrate is a short chain fatty acid that is a good fuel uh, for normal healthy colonocytes. The African-Americans who were fed the Western, uh, excuse me, the rural African diet increased the level of butyrate, whereas the rural Africans on the Westernized diet decreased. And if you look at bile acids, remember bile acids, they're primary bile acids, they converted to secondary bile acids by the bacteria in our bowel. And the secondary bile acids are thought to be more procarcinogenic than the primary bile acids. 
and the level of secondary bile acids dropped in the African Americans that were on the rural African diet and went up in the rural Africans on the westernized diet. So the bottom line here is even in a two week period, you could have dramatic changes in the level of proliferation in the colon that's likely affecting the microbiome and the metabolites in the bowel. The other thing to point out is uh, the relationship of environment and mutations. We do know that aspirin is a chemopreventive agent for colon cancer. It can reduce your risk for colon cancer in the right ages uh, by up to 50%. It can also reduce the recurrence of colon cancer if you had colon cancer. So that's called secondary chemoprevention. And in this study by Andy Chan out of the Mass General, looking using the Nursing Health Profession study, he showed that if you target patients whose tumor, original tumor, had a mutant PI3 kinase, uh, the probability of death with aspirin was dropped dramatically compared if you did not take aspirin. But if you express wild type PI3 kinase in your tumor, there was no difference. This occurred at the level of colon cancer specific mortality or overall mortality. So the bottom line is here, the type of mutation dictates the, how the environment affects the growth of or the recurrence of that tumor. Uh, another way to think of this is uh, in the colon, we progress from a normal colonic stem, uh, uh, stem cell um, that may get initiated uh, uh, into a tumor, we call it an adenoma, that may progress to high grade dysplasia and eventually carcinoma. And we see some of these steps accelerated, for instance, in FAP, where tumor initiation, the gene that caused that APC is greatly accelerates that. And also in limb syndrome, where it's a mismatch repair gene, which accelerates tumor progression. But you can take an FAP or limb syndrome patient with identical mutations, but their onset of cancer could be markedly different. And this is likely influenced by an environment at any one of these stages by what's the local microbiome and the level of inflammation that can influence the timing and tumor progression, as well as development of the metastasis. The last thing I'll say uh, as a prelude to what I'm gonna um, focus on is that the level of inflammation is highly important and probably it could be as more important than just classic uh, staging. So this is this was a, the original study by Jeremy Galon um, out of uh, Spain, I believe, um, where he looked at um, CD3 positive T cells. These are cells that uh, these are this is a marker that is a pan lymphocyte marker, and he by looking at the level of uh, lymphocytes at the center of the tumor CT or the invasive margin, if they were high, if you had a high number of those lymphocytes, you had pretty good overall disease-free uh, survival, irrespective of the staging, whether one, two, or three. But if you had low center, uh, tumor center and low invasive margin level of these lymphocytes, your survival was worse, irrespective of the staging uh, that was done. And stage four did bad no matter what because they were already metastasized. So the bottom line is the level of inflammation and particularly certain types of lymphocytes can predict the outcome even much better than staging. So let me give you an example of how the genetics change the environment. And you, you probably don't realize you see this every day, um, uh, but I'm just gonna highlight it for you. So I work in the area of DNA mismatch uh, repair for some of my basic and translational work. And um, I'm just gonna explain to you that this system is evolutionary conserved. It's, it's uh, found in bacteria. In fact, Paul Mulder, it's got the Nobel prize for its description in bacteria. It's found in yeast, it's found all the way to human cells. It's in every cell of your body. And these proteins, um, you'll hear the term MSH2, uh, MSH6, MSH3, MLH1, PMS2, these proteins work together as heterodimers and they can recognize mispairs in the double strand DNA. Here's a CT mismatch. And when it recognizes it, it will call on the other proteins and signal for repair. 
The other aspect of these mismatch repair proteins, they can, uh, MSH2 can bind to MSH3 and recognize insertion deletion loops. So what are these? I call it the broken zipper model. These are sequences we call microsatellites because they're repetitive sequences of a length of DNA. In this case, here's multiple AAGs. They have to pair with the TTTCs on the opposite strand, but any one of these units can pair with any one of these, AT, these TTTCs on the opposite strand. And if they don't pair correctly, you get either a loop out on one of the strands what that's called insertion deletion loop because it depends on if it's on the newly synthesized or the template strand. This I leave like the broken zipper where a piece of zipper sticks out. And then these proteins recognize that loop and then lead to excision and then repair and pairing them correctly such that the zipper works correctly. Um, so mismatch repair can recognize single base pair mismatches and these insertion deletion loops at microcellular sequences that eventually signal and uh, ultimately lead to repair or uh, intrinsic cell death. So what are some features of uh, tumors with mismatch repair? Well, this is seen in 15% of all sporadic colon cancers. It's obviously seen in Lynch, but it's also seen in 15% of sporadic cancers. These tumors display microcellular instability. That's those frame shifts at those microcellular sequences because it can't repair them. And so they either shorten or lengthen. That's what we call microcellular instability. And it's associated with loss of mismatch repair proteins. In fact, your the pathology department like ours stains every single colon cancer that comes out of uh, the operating room for the presence of these proteins to identify possible Lynch syndrome patients. The interesting thing with this particular uh, defect in mismatch repair is that 70% uh, form right-sided cancers, okay? Um, they show poor differentiation and 40% have mucin components. These tumors are hypermutated, as I mentioned before, and they contain up to a thousand mutations because of the nature of the defect of mismatch repair. These tumors are almost always diploid. They lack P53 mutations, unlike the classic Vogel uh, uh, Steen model. But the fascinating thing is these cancers attract a number of T cells. And in fact, they form subepithelial lymphoid nodules. Uh, almost, uh, you know, the, the, in, in certain diseases, we look for granulomas. Well, this is like a T a T cell granuloma. Sometimes we call it a Crohn's-like reaction because you can get granulomas and Crohn's. But these formed as a result of the defect in mismatch repair. And I'm gonna walk through that in a second. Um, they're also resistant to five few. I'm not gonna talk about that, but they show longer survival because of these colon cancers attracting these T cells. Now, what is that? That actually, those T cells surround the tumor and they are in response to the defect in mismatch repair because some of the genes I pointed to have a structural component that frame shifts their reading frame. You make a novelly truncated um, antigen that is immunogenic. This was shown by um, uh, Schwartali way back in 2008, where uh, he took from microcellular stable tumors, their T cells, these extracted T cells, and in the lab made these predicted truncated uh, proteins. And he showed that in a Petri dish that they will react to those truncated proteins. They are already primed. But if you take it from a microcellular stable tumor that didn't have a defect in the symmetry repair, those T cells didn't recognize those uh, neoantigens. Then he looked at the T cells from peripheral blood. Was this a universal phenomenon beyond the tumor? So the answer was yes. So if you took the peripheral T cells and looked at the frame shifts from an MSI colorectal cancer patient, they responded. They did not respond to a microcellular stable colorectal cancer patient. And fascinating, because Lynch syndrome is a germline mutation in this symmetry repair, a uh, patient with uh, Lynch syndrome who had can colon cancer, their T cells responded to these truncated um, neoantigens. And fascinating, if you take a Lynch syndrome who you identify as a germline mutation, but never had a cancer, not even colon cancer, no, any cancer, 
their T cells were already responding to those new angins. This suggests that they're making small amounts, almost like a vaccination. And so once they develop a tumor, those T cells will home in around a tumor because that tumor is making these new engines like you wouldn't believe and uh, surround a tumor. And is thought is that that process is responsible for their, sh their um, longer survival compared to someone who doesn't have an MSI high tumor. This is also shown by the Galone group looking at memory T cells. So if you have an MSI high tumor that you, over the development, you develop a lot more memory T cells because of those neoangins being made compared to patients with microsatellite stable tumors. So the way I think of this is in the, in the pathway of developing a, the 15% of MSI high tumors, when you go from a normal cell, you still have to inactivate the, the key pathway, which is the Wnt signaling pathway, but you lose mismatch repair early, whether you're a Lynch, um, Lynch-like or sporadic um, uh, mismatch repair deficient. You'll develop an adenoma, sometimes very quickly. Some of these will get BRAF mutations, but then you develop a lot of these um, uh, DNA mutations, this hypermutable phenotype, because of the structure of these genes containing coding microsatellites. And the truncated version of these become immunogenic neopeptides that call in this protective T cells while you're accumulating more somatic frame shift mutations. And eventually you actually express program death uh, uh, receptors that make it much more susceptible to a checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Um, uh, and, uh, and so another way to think of this, you alter DNA mismatch repair, you get these target gene mutations, you induce this T cell protective inflammation, and the biological consequence of this is reduced metastases in patients who have this type of tumor. Now, this was even one up with uh, uh, some work out of initially Hopkins and now um, Manoro Slow Kettering, showing that these tumors express PD-1 ligand and are susceptible to immune checkpoint inhibitor that we use every day now. And this was the original paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015, looking at the change in tumor marker, the, all, essentially all the blue are mismatch repair deficient or MSI tumors. They responded not only with tumor markers, but they responded in, in uh, the radiographically. And in fact, 78% of deficient mismatch repair tumors had improved um, uh, so survival uh, compared to those who had proficient mismatch repair um, as well. So another way to, to look at this is you can have germline or somatic inactivation of mismatch repair. This, this germline is Lynch, somatic is dysphoretic. You get a lot of uh, frame shift mutations as well as point mutations. I will point out that in the genome, a human genome, there are over 100,000 microsatellites with only 500 of this 100,000 in these coding genes, but that's enough to make these immunogenic peptides from these frame shifts from these coding genes that eventually make uh, the patient who develops a colon cancer um, immune checkpoint uh, sus uh, susceptible, as well as already having baseline improved survival compared to patients without DNA mismatch repair defects. So that was an example of how the genetics changed the environment. Okay, now I'm going to flip the script and show how the environment can change the genetics. Now, just going back to mismatch repair, so I pointed out that the gene MSH2 can pair with MSH3 or MSH6 as shown by these arrows, and the other uh, MLH1 pairs with PMS2. Now, what I did is overlay in this diagram is what we define as microsatellite high, low, and something called EMAS. So the NCI definition of microsatellite instability, uh, unstable or instability is the presence of mononucleotide like A to the N or dinucleotide C to the N frame shifts or instability. That is the definition of MSI high. There was a, a, a NCI definition of MSI low, but no one knew what caused that. But it turns out all the MSI low are all dinucleotide frame shifts. And in uh, about 10 years ago, uh, uh, there was uh, some head, neck, and urine uh, cancers 
showed that uh, there was frame shift in tetranucleotide instability. And it turns out it's dinucleotide through tetranucleotide instability. And this is an uh, entity we now call elevated microsatellite alterations at selected tetranucleotide repeats or EMAST. And if you overlay this, you can see that EMAS, if you took out just one of these mismatch repair proteins, which one would it be? It turns out it's MSH3. Knowing the profile of how it recognizes these insertion deletion loops completely overwraps 100% with MSI low and EMAS. And so we suspected that from the beginning. Of course, no one could uh, prove it until we did some uh, knockouts of MSH3 showing that that's what drives it. So what is EMAS uh, in Kong Hansen's? This is the most common mismatch repair defect that you probably haven't even heard of yet. This is observed in 50% of all sporadic cancers, and it's also seen in other cancers. These tissues display these tetranucleotide instability and early on, there was some evidence of heterogeneous or reduced MSH3 nuclear expression, but no one could figure out exactly um, how that was uh, causing the EMAS because no one could find any epigenetic or uh, frame uh, or excuse me um, mutation of MSH3 to drive it. The cancers appear distributed throughout the colon. These tumors are not hypermutated unlike the classic MSI high ones. But um, if you look at these tumors, unlike the classic T cell subepithelial Crohn's-like reaction, there's this intimacy of inflammatory cells that uh, surround the glands of the tumor. And so that was a clue that this could be a driver for EMS. In other words, in one sense, the genetics were driving the inflammatory marker, but in this one, it might be the inflammation driving this genetic change. Interestingly, even though this is a mismatch repair defect, it is the opposite of classic MSI high. Patients with EMAS colorectal cancer show shorter survival, more metastases, and poor prognosis in advanced stage disease. So this is almost the exact opposite of classic MSI high. And we've and other groups have published that there's a higher frequency of these EMAS in colon cancers from African American tumors, which have a higher and younger onset and uh, of uh, colon cancer uh, and poor prognosis. This is a study by Garcia Na showing this. If you look at a group of tumors that in, in, you characterize by MSI high, this is the recurrence free survival. You look at MSI high, they do extremely well. If you look at the ones that have this EMAS, they don't do it as well. And this was as statistical as the stage of these patients as showing this uh, difference. We, uh, because we saw this um, uh, intimacy of the inflammation, um, we started looking at cytokines. And we started looking at tumors and we know that many uh, tumors, not only colon cancers, can uh, show expression of cytokines. But this one was very interesting because the association of IL-6, a common pro-inflammatory cytokine, almost paralleled with the presence of EMAS. Here showing more staining for IL-6 um, was associated with EMAS positive tumors and less staining was shown with EMAS negative tumors. And we actually looked at a number of different uh, cytokines. So we pursued this and uh, this paper was published uh, about five or six years ago, which showed a novel way of inactivating MSH3. So we couldn't find genetic mutation or epi mutation. So let me just walk through this uh, very quickly. This is immunofluorescence staining for MSH3 in green. The epi stains the nuclei in blue and the merge is an overlap. So you can see all the green and blue overlap showing that MSH3, a mismatch repair protein that repairs DNA, is all in the nucleus. But if you give IL-6, you see the green disperse outside the nucleus. So it seems to change its location. Down in panel B, this is shown a different way by Western blots. This is the egg yolk and egg white separation. So the egg yolk is the nucleus, the egg white is the cytosol. And with increasing doses of IL-6, 
you can see uh, the protein MSH3 exits the nucleus, drops in proportion, and gets picked up in the cytosol simultaneously with the IL-6. This is unique to MSH3. MSH6 does not move, MSH2 does not move, MLH1 does not move. And you can see the purity of this because histones are in the nucleus and tubulin is in the cytosol, okay? So no mutation, epimutation, but a change in location of the MSH3 protein. Also in panel D, this is an intrinsic a genomic tetranucleotide sequence in the human genome, a, a site called NYCL1. Just by giving IL-6 over two weeks shows the eight to tenfold increase in frame shift mutation at that locus, meaning that when MSH3 is out of the nucleus, you're frame shifting the DNA, causing a DNA mutations. So the way to think of this, and I won't go through all the details, that probably unlike the classic MSI high, you've got to initiate tumor development or neoplasia, but there's something that drives inflammation. And then that inflammation secondary causes MSH3 to lose its function in 50% of colon cancers. Now, what's the driver of that subsequently are those target gene mutations, but also MSH3 is a unique mismatch repair protein because it's complex, unlike the uh, uh, other complexes in mismatch repair, is also involved in homologous recombination repair. And so they can affect double strand breaks when it's gone. But the biological consequences are that you get increased metastasis opposite of the classic MSI high. So you saw this top part already. In this part, thinking of inflammation, you subsequently defective MSH3, this gets frame shifts at uh, dye and tetranucleotide microsite sequences and DNA double strand breaks that leads to poor survival compared to patients without MSH3 defect. I mentioned some data that I didn't show today, uh, higher in African Americans. And I will also point out, this is also found in tumors that are bathed with IL-6. Uh, we've published a paper on ulcerative colitis showing that biopsies with ulcerative colitis have already in, without any dysplasia, already have EMAS present. And the amount of EMAS gets picked up when you acquire dysplasia, as well as you acquire UC uh, derived cancers. We've also looked at this in some lung cancers and those with inflammation display as EMAS. You can find EMAS in some adenomas and they're almost always associated with this level of inflammation. So let me, uh, one last uh, area, I'm going to talk about the microbiome environment because that's tied, in a, sorry for the typo there. Over time, um, there's been a number of pieces of data showing this, um, re a relationship um, between the level of neoplasia in the colon and a level of microbiome and changes. Um, sorry about that. Um, uh, the real question is what's the chicken, what's the egg? Are there genetic changes that happen in the epithelium and those genetic changes uh, attract a certain type of uh, microbiome environment as it's growing into an advanced adenoma and cancer? Or does the microbiome somehow influence the, uh, as the environment influence the epithelial behavior and then it acquires mutations that help advance this. So it's what's the chicken, what's the egg? And so this is a hard question to answer, um, but there's been some progress on this. And this is not from my own lab, this is from several other labs. Um, I'll tell you that when uh, looking at specific microbiome uh, bugs, um, there have been two that have been truly associated with early neoplasia, development of adenomas. This is colobactin producing E. coli, as well as enterotoxigenic B. fresh. These are two common bugs that make toxins that have strong epidemiology, strong microbial enrichment with these, um, and they both make a toxin. And I'll say later, so this is more advanced polyps and cancers, there's been association with Fusobacterium species, particularly Fusobacterium nucleatum, 
uh, which originates in the oral cavity, by the way, but somehow finds its way to the colon. Um, again, strong epidemiology, strong microbial enrichment, and also can make a toxin. And let me just walk through the, each one of those uh, briefly. This is data from Cynthia Sears' work at uh, Johns Hopkins, um, who published this fantastic paper a couple of years ago in Science, looking at FAP patients. This is familial adenomas, palposis patients who develop lots of uh, clonic uh, adenomas. And it's paired a like phenotype um, in mice, they call it mutant APC mice. So if you look at FAP patients compared to control patients who don't have a lot of adenomas, she looks at the biofilm on the adenoma or in the surrounding normal mucosa. And she found particularly this PKS positive E. coli was enriched in FAP patients compared to controls. There was an enrichment of enterotoxigenic BFRAG compared to controls. And the combination of two was enriched compared to controls. But when you looked at neither, it was um, neither was more strongly for the controls, which makes sense. If you, then she took those two bugs and put them in mice. And so if you uh, take mice, and so this is survival of the mice on the y-axis and days post-inoculation of the bugs on the x-axis. If you give enterotoxigenic B fragile by itself, the mice live 110 days. The PKS positive E. coli by itself, 110 days. But the combination of the two, they cut their um, survival down. If you look at what causes the inflammation, here's sham. Here's the B fragile, a little bit of elevation. The E. coli, not much. But the two combined raised the level of inflammation in the colon. And then she took a knockout mice, a mouse that had IL-17 knocked out. And when you knock out IL-17, you knock out IL-6 production because it's downstream from IL-17. And this is looking at the number of tumors developed in these mice. So in the wild type mice sh showing both of these uh, bugs, you're making these polyps in these APC mutant mice. But if you take out the pro-inflammatory cytokine direction, they don't make the tumors. So increased inflammation, faster tumor onset, poor survival, and dependent on cyto pro inflammatory cytokine. This is another study by Cynthia Sears group looking at the fusobacterium. So she, this is, uh, she mapped out where fusobacterium is in the large bowel and tumors. And you can see the ones that had fusobacterium biofilm are the ones in the red dot. They're almost always in the right side of the colon. This is the right, the transfers, the left, sigmoid, and rectum. And this is too, uh, enriched in the tumors. Here's normal compared to tumor. And you see the acquirement of these kind of aqua blue areas that's all fusobacterium. In fact, it was found in the majority of these right-sided. If they were biofilm negative, they, were not, uh, they, they did not possess this biofilm. And the risk of proximal cancer with this fusobacter uh, biofilm was five-hold higher. Now, keep in mind on the right side, we do see more MSI tumors, these hypermutated uh, tumors. This is also from that study showing that it's associated, the biofilm positive compared to no biofilm uh, is associated uh, with a production of IL-6, either in the epithelium or in, in inflammatory cells. And IL-6 uh, triggers STAT-3, and that's also associated with the biofilm downstream. If you look at just the normal colonic crypts, looking at proliferation, she stains these with KI-67, with a brown stain. With cancer or without cancer, there was way more proliferation in the crypts if you were biofilm positive compared to biofilm negative, suggesting that this, this helps drive the inflammation. Now, the, the last thing I'll say in this piece is that um, the, this is looking at fusobacterium because it's been associated with these right-sided cancers and you know, does this affect the growth of the cancers and metastases? This is a fantastic study by Matt Myerson's group out at Harvard, which looked at RNA and cytohyperization for fusobacterium. So these are two cancers. This is the, a primary cancer up top and it's paired liver metastases on the bottom. The left is low powered, the right is high powered. And you can see in this area, all the pink, that's the presence of fusobacterium on the cancer cells, okay? And the same thing with this other uh, patient's tumor. Now, if you go to the paired liver metastases, you can find the fusobacterium in the liver metastases, okay? Now, the question 
the next question Matt asks, and the, the appropriate question is, two things could happen. One is the cancer developed and you metastasize it and you secondarily seed it with fusobacterium, or is it the other hypothesis that the, met, the, the cancer uh, was seeded with the fusobacterium as the metastasis developed. So he tried to answer this by steerily passing these patients' tumors through eight generations of mice. And basically, you can detect fusobacterium by this serial passage through eight generations of mice, and you can culture it through four. And so his conclusion was that the bacteria is traveling with the uh, metastases and facilitating the growth of the, uh, of the cancer, even in the metastasis location. This is also demonstrated here by use of metronidazole, which is, a, a, you know, fusobacterium is an anaerobic bug. So if you have a non-fusobacterium, this is just HT29 cells, no difference. But if you take the patient-derived xenograft that had the fusobacterium, you had a 30% reduction, 30% reduction in tumor growth with an antibiotic, okay? And this is shown in these other graphs there. Now, in uh, Suji Ogino uh, out of the Broad and uh, uh, Brigham uh, did this a different way. He looked, uh, he looked at this, the nursing health profession study, and he looked at uh, empiric dietary score, which he called EDIP, which is a weighted intake of 18 foods constructed to predict the plasma levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines. The, the fascinating thing about this was that what they found is only in proximal colon cancer um, there was there a significant association with fusobacterium uh, there. So if you had pro-inflammatory diet, you're more likely to get fusobacterium in proximal colon cancer. That was not the case in distal cancers and in erectile cancer. So in a totally different study, fusobacterium is clearly associated with right-sided colon cancers, this anaerobic bug, and even on the um, Cynthia Sears study. So two different ways showing the same thing. Now, why do I say this is important? This is important um, as we try to figure out what is causing the increased rise in young onset cancer. So this is just data showing that it is clearly an environmental driver based on your year of birth. If you're born after 1960, that's when the rise, here's 20 to 24 all the way up to 50 began and while the other ones have dropped. But if you also look at the year of diagnosis, so when these people from 1960 were, were 30 years old in 1990 and beyond, you can see that it's increased largely for those under the age of 50, while it's dropped for those over the age of 50. This is the same thing here. If you were born before 1960, uh, cancers under the age of 50 were low, but they started going up after that. And you can see around 1990, there's an elbow here, and you can see the rise based on the year diagnosis. So what is driving this? We, the answer is we don't know, but it's got to be something in the environment, because this is not genetic evolution at all. So I, I, have, I have lots of hypotheses, but I want to point out one thing to you. And this was a fascinating paper in Science Translational Medicine a few years ago that looked at uh, something called triclosan in use in mice. Um, uh, most of you might not know what triclosan is. Triclosan is an antimicrobial agent uh, that is in 2200 consumer products. It's put in liquid soap to make it antimicrobial. It's put in toothpaste to make it antimicrobial. It's embedded on mattresses, furniture, kids, uh, sucking toys, etc., uh, to make it antimicrobial. The FDA uh, stopped uh, allowing companies to advertise for it in 2016 because there was absolutely no benefit of the substance with it or the substance without it uh, on the benefit of, uh, for instance, soaps. Um, the only study that showed a benefit of use of triclosan in, in the medical literature was that it did reduce some gingivitis and that's why it got in toothpaste. It turns out 75% of us in the United States excrete this in our urine. So we're all exposed to it. No one had ever studied this stuff. And guess when it came out? In the early 1960s. And uh, so this group 
uh, just added triclosan and gave it to mice. And first of all, it caused some colonic inflammation by itself. Second, they had, this is a uh, DSS AOM model of colon cancer in mice. And the only difference is they gave the DSM AOM alone or with the triclosan, the TCS here. And you can see if you got triclosan, the mice died uh, much more rapidly. They developed more tumors. The tumors were bigger. The average number of tumors went up. They expressed way more beta catenin, which is a proto-oncogene. The tumors were much bigger, more proliferation, et cetera. All I'm saying is there's things in our macro environment that are affecting things in our colon. So let me close in saying the environment plays a major role in cancer formation, progression of metastasis. Colon cancer is a great example of that. And understanding these pathways involves affords intervention strategies, including diet intervention, as I showed you in the O'Keefe studies, aspirin and the personalized medicine use of it based on mutations if someone's had colon cancer before, microbiome intervention, and inflammation and prevention or modification. So some questions to address, how does the environment influence differential genetic susceptibilities? I showed you about aspirin PI3 kinase. Uh, these are some things to think about. How does the environment contribute to disease, disease formation, development of adenomas in colon cancer? How does the environment generate changes in cellular paths that could be targeted, such as IL-6 inflammation, the loss of DNA mismatch repair? How do we identify the genetically susceptible? Well, we, we can do germline analysis in one, but that's not the majority of these patients. What about soma somatic mutation analysis with the disease or maybe even before disease? And what in the environment leads to changes in the genome for disease formation? In other words, what is driving the increase in young onset colon cancer uh, there? So I will stop there and uh, open for questions, and I hope that was useful. Thank you so much for such an amazing talk, uh, Dr. Ketters. And there was actually a question that came uh, right before you uh, talked to us about the Edip and, and uh, Fusobacterium, but I will go ahead and, and ask the question anyway. Um, do you have any insight on the mutagenic profile of CRC in young patients, i.e. less than 40 <laughs> years of age uh, versus older, older generation or older population? Yeah, I wish I knew the answer, but I know several people, including at your own institution, are looking at that. Um, the, the, there are some um, uh, genetic, uh, slight genetic differences in some of those young onset. They're not dramatically different than old onset, so we don't have a, a sign of quinone, you know, uh, major finding that said, this is it, you know. I think it's gonna be, um, um, and, um, those subtle changes are, the timing and the frequency of, of, you know, APC versus P53 and all these other stuff. But I'm not sure that's enough to say that we know this is a young onset versus an old onset cancer um, or later onset cancer. So the answer is we don't know yet. But I will say two things. One is it's likely something in the environment that's triggering something in the local microbiome that's affecting this. I think we're all exposed, whether you're young or old, this is one hypothesis, but that since we screen people over age 50, now move to age 45, that we don't see it because they're getting screened, but we're seeing it in the younger people. That's one option, or it's something environment that selectively affects younger people, um, maybe at a very young age, and then that we're seeing this a rapid progression before they get to age 45 or 50 or older. I think it's probably the former rather than later, but what that is, I don't know. The, the subsequent genetic changes, everyone's trying to figure out, but right now they're not dramatically different from the later onset. So we don't have a coup de grace, you know, uh, a signature. Um, there's some studies out there suggesting that they found it, but none of them are very strong right now. Um, so I don't have a full answer to that, but a lot of people are studying that. Thank you. Um, I don't see any additional question yet, but I'm monitoring the chat window here. There are multiple excellent hard comments here. Uh, so thank you again. And I'm not sure if, if you have any uh, comment or thoughts about the use or potential 
I don't know, consideration of using um, antibiotics like metronidazole, for example, in the future, or how do we then adjust uh, our environment, aka the, the food that we eat, are the particular things to avoid, or, uh, or how do we address, uh, again, the, the latest uh, um, uh, knowledge that we've acquired from these multiple sure. studies? So Sure, the, the latter part about adjusting food, that's the hardest thing. I mean, we, knew, we know that lifestyle changes, the type of things you can diet, and we're, we're a victim of where we're born, you know, your socioeconomic status. If you live in the, the wrong zip code and, you know, you have a grocery store desert and you're going to eat whatever this, you're exposed more to tobacco, you're going to have one environment, but that's the victim of society in some cases, not necessarily your genetics versus if you're in a higher socioeconomic and you have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. These are lifestyle things. And so, you know, as I showed in the Steve O'Keefe, I mean, these things can happen rapidly, but if just imagine that times 40 years, 50 years, and the, you know, the higher level of proliferation, the more toxic metabolites, you're, you set yourself up for getting, you know, you know neoplasia and, and cancer. Um, so, and changing diet is hard because some of this is socioeconomic and political to some degree, and it's hard for people, you know, like I'm used to eating this, you got to change it. Oftentimes people will change their diet when they have a heart attack or a stroke. You're like, oh, I, I had the heart attack now. Now I need to change my diet, but you should have changed it 25 years before. Um, the same thing for cancer, because these will develop silently until, you know, you get symptoms. That's the hard thing. The easier thing, at least in the field of colon cancer, is screening. So we do know that screening is a modifiable factor and get it. And so if we get more people in the screening, you can reduce the, their risk. We don't screen 25 and 35 year olds. We screen 50 year olds and up and starting recently 45 year olds and up. So that's, that's gonna probably be the um, easier answer, at least in the United States. I mean, we tell people to change your diet all the time, but it is, it is tough and it depends on their situation. Um, in terms of the first part was uh, avoiding, you know, using antibiotics. Um, that's a little harder one. So that was a fantastic study by Matt Meyerson and uh, some other groups have shown that there's probably some bacteria relationship. Um, uh, we even have to characterize um, each one of those uh, tumors or give it a shot, you know, Flagell is not without its toxicity, but in short term, it's great. But do you do it long term? Does it get receded? We don't know that. Um, or are you going to get peripheral neuropathy after you know, years and years of flagell use? I don't know um, in that ex example. Um, I think we still need to do more work. I think um, once we know a little bit more about how we have to characterize A, the, the, the types of bugs and the sensitivities of bugs, for this, yeah. So the, the world of infectious disease may get into the world of oncology and then that they, they, and, and that may happen more and more, but we, we're still in its infancy, I think, in, in that range. So we're not quite ready to do that, um, uh, but we may at, the, at some point. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, additional question, how long and what would it take to get the tracosin out of the environment <laughs> and reduce that exposure risk? <laughs> Yeah, well, so that's one hypothesis. So I, I just mentioned that because that study was so fascinating. Um, I don't know if that is the answer, but um, there are a number of compounds in our environment that we don't know what does to our health. That particular one um, in that study, that study was wonderful. And I would recommend reading that paper if you're interested, because they used knockout mice. They showed it was through TLR4 signaling and et cetera, et cetera. They put it in germ-free facilities, showed it, it didn't, it didn't um, change the risk, but without the germ-free that your risk went higher, et cetera, in these mice. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's gonna be something like that or a combination of things that's probably came well after 1960 or, or maybe 1950s or 60s or 70s. I just put that because I know that's in all these consumer products. So the FDA has put a kibosh on their advertising of it. But if you notice, there are still some marketing of other compounds in like these antimicrobial bar soaps, liquid soaps. Um, again, a lot of these things have not been studied for other health reasons. And, you know, um, 
you know, there, there's a lot of theories on this young onset. There, there's um, use of antibiotics in the young, you know, and that's changing their risk. There's the obesity uh, epidemic since the, particularly since the 70s, we're heavier. We have more hyperinsulinemia. Um, um, and so there's a lot of theories. That's just ones. So I think if you want to buy soap and toothpaste without it, that's fine. I, I, I know there's no benefit of it, so I don't get it, but um, we're all exposed to it. You might go to the airport, wash your hands and find it uh, in that, and you don't even know it. So that's all I can say about that. <laughs> Thank you. And I guess, um, you know, there is a trend with, with lifestyle modification here. And there's another question uh, about that. Given the reduction in inflammation with dietary changes, how can that impact individuals who already have polyps or cancer? Yeah, so, so first of all, we have to know if they have polyps and cancer. So you should get screened. Um, uh, you know, not every polyp or adenoma turns into a cancer. The one that, because we knew that we could say, hey, remove this one, not remove this. We remove all of them because the potential is there, but we don't know which ones. But we do know that um, those things I put in the modifiable list, you know, um, using aspirin insets appropriately, and there's a lot of controversy about that because there's side effects to those things. But but diet um, diet intervention using a, a high fiber, lower calorie, lower red meat type of diet. Um, again, this has to be more long term though. Um, so you might get some short-term benefits as Steve O'Keefe showed, but it's really the, because these polyps don't develop overnight, they take, they, they take time, but you're setting up the conditions. So it really truly has to be a lifestyle change. You're talking the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, so you might get some short-term <laughs> microscopic benefits, but I think the, the long-term benefits, and it's not perfect either because even aspirin, which reduces our risk, primary prevention is, is almost 50%. That means it didn't work for the other 50% either. So it's not perfect, but all these things are cumulative. You know, taking vitamin D or calcium might reduce your risk by 10 to 12%, those types of things. Um, smoking reduces another 9 or 10%. So doing all the right things, you're probably going to improve your chances and lower your risk. Um, but their lifestyle changes. That's the key thing. Wonderful. Getting screened is the easy piece. So most Americans say, I turn 45 or 50, let's get screened. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to give just a few more minutes for questions. I think we actually got past the uh, one hour mark here, but uh, such a terrific talk. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Carters. Well, thank you so kindly. Any last minute question? I just would like to thank you very much for the elegant presentation. Thanks so, so much, Dr. Mendelson. And I hope the other Dr. Mendelsons, uh, the, the upper, other doctors Mendelsons are listening and thank you as well. Attentively, we had a lovely picture of him as he listened to your lecture. Oh, wonderful. Thanks a lot, Dr. Carruthers. We really appreciate your talk. That was wonderful. And I'll, I'll see you in the next Zoom link. Yes. <laughs> and I think uh, two, two or three minutes, right? Yep. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, thank you for having me today. And I hope all you guys have a good rest of the day.